this has been not the year, you know, the, the start of, of the years to come of the status of southern resident killer whales. This past week, uh, we hosted a workshop here with DFO and NIMPS, where we had, an, out of three days, one entire day was about new research findings about southern resident killer whales. It's amazing how much has been learned, um, and it's amazing how much more is going to be learned, and Sheila Thornton will be telling you that after lunch about some of the new program uh, that she is overseeing and Canada's contribution to figuring out what's going on with Southern residents. The one thing that I've noticed, however, is when people talk about Southern residents, we talk about how many there are, and we all want recovery, that there seems to be a fair amount of confusion about what are the facts. And there seems to be a lot of different public perceptions and I've written down some of the things that I've either read in newspapers or I've heard at science conferences or I've heard people say. And, and here's my list. Southern resident killer whales have been declining for 20 years. There are now just 76. They're down from a high of 140 decades ago. They're all starving. They're the most contaminated animal and they are critically endangered. And I'm sure on this list, all of you maybe pick out which ones are factual and which ones maybe aren't, or maybe they're all factual. Or maybe they're just slight stretches of the truth. But I think we have a responsibility as researchers, as a community who should be really well informed, to be able to explain to people what is going on and what is the recovery goal? What are we looking for? How many should there be? So out of this list, only actually one is really factually true. There are now 76. Um, that's un indisputable. And I just want to talk about a few of these things that are on here, because some of them are sort of true. Like, are they critically endangered? Well, in fact, in Canada, we don't have anything as critically endangered. Um, we have species that are at risk, that are either um, not at risk, data deficient, special concern, threatened, or endangered. And so when people put out critically endangered, well, those are categories that are used in Europe, the IUCN, but in Canada, they're just endangered. Let's talk here for a minute about numbers. So what are the trends? And I don't know how many of you have seen numbers to sort of get a sense of it. And if someone asks you how many did there used to be, um, what are we talking about? So this is a data set that's been compiled by the Center for Whale Research, and they probably do the most accurate and consistent on the water accountings. This goes back to 1960. Uh, the hatch period is done for models because whales were removed uh, for the aquarium industry. And we bring it out to present at, at 2017 with, with 76 whales. And so it has been declining for 20 years. Well, technically, if you fit a line to this, you could say, well, yeah, we take the highest point and we draw it out. But anybody doing just basic regression knows that this is not a good fit. Because someone could actually be up here telling you that, you know what, they've been increasing for the past 45 years. Right? So what are we doing here with numbers? As we try to fit what we would like to to these numbers. This is what the data is. So maybe it's fair to say they've been fluctuating for 57 years. Is that what we should be telling the public? Or we say they've declined four times in the past 50, 57 years. Um, this most dramatic one caused by removals, um, some recovery and then decline, increases then another decline from a high of 98, and then this most recent one. So that in fact, they've been declining for six years, is what they've been declining. We were talking about recovery. I don't know how many of you asked your friends. I mean, they go, oh my gosh, there's only 76. Um, we need to do something. So what is recovery? And I've had people say, well, I think there should be, well, at least 200, but 700. That's what our goal is. We should get back to 700. And then you tell them, but did you know that in the last 100 years, as far as you know, they've never exceeded 100? 98 is the highest we've ever known there to be. So. Are we setting ourselves up for failure to talk about recovery as being something that should be, that we all know, is probably unattainable? 
Because one interpretation of this is that the whales have been at carry capacity, which fluctuates. Um, and they've been at a low of 66 um, and at a high of 98. So what are the recovery goals? What do we want? Well, in theory, you could use COSIWIC guidelines because that's what put them on the list in the first place. The thing with COSIWIC is that southern residents are endangered, number one, because there's so few, and in fact, they will always be endangered. They're never coming off the list uh, because one of our criteria is for small populations. Now, they could get um, butted up to threatened if we thought their future looked a bit more promising, like it appears to be for the northern residents. But the reality is that under our criteria, they're always going to be a threat, always going to be endangered and at best threatened due to the fact that they are so small and therefore they are inherently at risk. Um, so what's the target? Should we get them back to the 80 whales that were there in 1979? Um, do you want to get them back to the 98, the highest we've ever known them to be in 1995? Or do we really want the long-term average of 83? Um, and the fact is that they've numbered less than 100 for the past century, so maybe you want to keep them above 80. Or maybe, in fact, these numbers are all wrong. We shouldn't be talking about total numbers because if you've got 80 males, that's not going to do you any good at all. So the reality is we should probably be thinking about reproductive females and be trying to work towards a goal of having maybe 15, 20, 25. Um, we need to look at the age structures. But we need to set realistic goals because if we're going to be asking whale watchers to keep back, if we're going to be talking about fisheries, cutting them back, you need to give them goals of what it is we're working for. But you can't give this vague idea where we're trying to get them back to 700 or 200. We need to be real about this. Another one might be uh, we just want to keep them all looking fat and healthy, which is a reasonable goal. And certainly the drone work that's being done is phenomenal as a way to monitor individual animal health. But somewhere along the lines, we need to get on the same page for what it is we're working for. Starvation. So are all the whales starving? And I don't know what the root is of this because the fact is that they're not all starving. The reality is that the southern residents are on average thinner than the northern residents. And they do appear to be nutritionally stressed, but they're not starving. Um, and I think the trouble comes from these two pictures, which was J28 um, in, tw two, sorry, in 2015. Um, and as you look, as you come across the other picture, you can see how much thinner she is and how thin her calf is as well, and prior to her death. And so for this, we can say, so one interpretation is this animal is starving. But if any of you have ever, and therefore we should make more food, they're not, there's not enough food for her. But if anybody's ever had a friend or family member that has cancer, don't go to a hospital and say, there's a food shortage in this hospital. Um, and so for a vet who would look at the animal, they would see it perhaps differently than an ecologist and say, well, the animal is wasting, so what's the root cause? Here we have a species we know that shares food. So do you think they're going to let their, leave their aunt out uh, or mother from being fed? And so it does point out when there are problems. And again, this drone technology is so powerful. It's going to be a way to keep individual health records for each whale and figure out which ones are sick, as well as what the nutritional status is. Um, most contaminated animal? Well, no. Um, but they are certainly among the most contaminated marine mammals. If you want to talk about contamination, we can talk about the transient killer whales. But the curious thing is that they're increasing. Um, they've been on a positive trajectory, basically, since they were first documented. And so it has not affected their numbers. Uh, although there is concern that when animals get thin, that contaminants are stored in lipid could get mobilized. Um, and maybe, and there's also concern, could this be affecting sex ratios at birth? Um, so, but at this point, um, we can say that certainly the transients are the most um, contaminated. The other thing to recognize is that in many ways, the, the southern residents are an anomaly. Because other populations and species are doing really quite well. Look at our pinnipeds uh, that are all um, increasing, or in the case of harbor seals, have been capped by the transient killer whales. And we look at this line has been drawn like an international border between the northerns and southerns. But the northerns are increasing, and the clan that is overlapping and shares some of the range 
is doing really well. And so we have to ask ourselves, is it possible that, that we have the Northerns are pushing the Southerns out? And could one of the troubles be they're being outcompeted and there's a territorial takeover? I don't know that that's the case, but it's something that we need to be thinking about because we often want to go back to anything we see out there is human caused. But sometimes there's some things that are not and, and not all wildlife is necessarily good neighbors with each other. In the same way that humans are not always good neighbors with each other. So I guess my encouragement here is to try to recognize what are the facts. So southern resident killer whales have been declining for the past six years. There are now 76. They're down from a high of 98 two decades ago. They have numbered less than 100 for the past century. And this was also confirmed from some of the genetics work that was presented last week. Uh, they appear to be nutritionally stressed. They're among the most contaminated marine mammals and they are endangered. Looking ahead in terms of recovery, one could say, and it's been pointed out to us, that you know, the age structure and sex structure at the moment is similar to what it was uh, going back in the past. And so mathematically, it should work out. But as we know, as we look ahead to what does lie ahead, um, and this is where I think most people are most concerned, is that the crystal ball doesn't look very, very good for them. Um, they have a messed up sex ratio. Too many males are being born. You need more females. Um, projections for Chinook returns. And so while we know that overall our Chinook populations are down, fisheries have been scaled back, so the number of fish that have been coming back have been relatively constant. Um, but the projection is not good, largely because of these huge warm water events. And so the short-term prog short prognosis is really bleak for them, no question. Um, so I'm kind of leaving on kind of a downer. But I do want to say that it, it's so impressive to see the concern. We've got the Port of Vancouver um, that's actively engaged in, in the movement of vessels, their speeds. Um, DFO, the Canadian government, has put a huge amount of money in. You may be hearing more about that. Uh, there's concern from the whale watching fleets, from the fishing fleets. Um, and there was a large symposium held over a month ago, sponsored by the Canadian government. And there are over 300 people representing essentially every stakeholder from all over British Columbia and the United States as well. And I think there is a desired commitment to do something. Um, and I think we can play an important role by helping ensure the correct information is shared with the public. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Any? Oh, yeah. So um, I was just wondering, with this drone data that you're taking year after year, has there been any looking at the mean body condition of the populations and if that's changing? So first off, I'm not taking the drone data. Um, Lance Barrett-Leonard, uh, John Durbin, and Holly are the three researchers that are collecting it. And the time series isn't all that long, uh, but it's getting more and more complete. And um, but it is sort of picking up subtle changes, trying to figure out in the spring when the whales come back, uh, what condition are they in, how are they at the end of the fall. And so they've published a few papers, but I think we're just seeing the start of what's going to be sort of an annual um, health report card for each animal. And perhaps then can tease out everything from the effects of disease um, compared to the effects of fishing and salmon returns on things like that. Um, you mentioned warm water events. Uh, have there been studies linking um, their, the health of the population to climate change? So there's, I would say there's no been direct studies doing that per se, outside of recognizing that one of the underlying factors is their, their need for Chinook salmon, particularly large Chinook salmon, and recognizing on the salmon biology side that not as many fish are coming back as should be coming back, and largely because we think that once they leave and get out into the open ocean, the food base is not there for them because of water temperature. So everybody is suspecting that, that on top of everything else that could be natural, we have now these huge effects of climate change that's probably going to have much bigger effects on Chinook salmon, as well as some of the other salmon species. So you know, stock up your freezer now, 
as well, because not only are, are the killer whales perhaps going to find a shortage, but um, so are our people. As well. Question? Um, I was just curious, like, I know definitely early on in the season, uh, the Center for Well Research, who collects a lot of the census data and stuff like that, had troubles basically tracking down the southern residents early in the season and getting a good, uh, good census. What do you think that says, A, for the status in general that you've been going over, and B, in terms of keeping these records, like the health report cards and the census and things? So I'm going to leave probably the answer to that to, there'll be a couple of presentations this afternoon, uh, one from the whale watching fleets in terms of what they were seeing. Um, certainly one interpretation of the low numbers that came back this summer, and we had a similar thing, I think, about six years ago. Um, and um, is that, well, they didn't come back because there wasn't enough fish here for them. But another way to look at it, because I remember in the first time that we had these really low returns, that we were on one of our sea lion cruises, and we were seeing um, whales everywhere. Um, and it turned out to be a year when the record salmon returns are coming back to California. So one interpretation, so the simple one is they're not here because there's no food, but another one is actually there's more food outside so they don't have to come in. So we just have to be careful in giving very simple interpretations, something we understand to be the norm, and when it changes is because we didn't understand what the true norm was. But again, with each year we learn more, and I think we will get to the bottom of it ultimately. I recognize that it is lunchtime, so I will take maybe one last one here, and then myself, I know Sheila, and there's a few others here too that know so much about uh, Southern residents that would be pleased to talk more. So um, I was just wondering what your opinion would be on if the classification of these southern killer whales being endangered or critically endangered is helping or hindering kind of where they're at, and if the ch it changes public perception of them as well. Yeah, no, I suspect that, you know, when people are using the word critically endangered, it's not a Canadian term. It doesn't exist. And it's because they want to put a sense of urgency. And we do have a government that wants to take action. At the symposium, we had our Minister of Fisheries here. We had the Minister of Transport as well. And they all had the very same line. We're going to take action. Uh, the goal of the workshop we had this past week was to look at short-term actions that could be taken. It could increase either the abundance of fish that are currently in the ocean or also making those more, uh, more accessible. Um, so we have a government that wants to take action. So I suspect the misuse of the critical is a sense of urgency. And, but again, when we look at those long-term records, can see that you know, one could make a case, well, they're sort of like in the middle. But I think the real concern that I see is what's coming for them. And so there is a need to get ready and to find ways to make things better, um, particularly, I think, in the area of just making things more accessible uh, so that the presence of boats doesn't interrupt feeding events. Um, one of the big differences between the north and the southern is just the amount of human activity around them. And it's something that is of concern to all the biologists. I'm sure a concern here as well is how do we mitigate that? People want to get close to the animals, um, but we don't want to love them to death. So um, there's a need for research on that, at the same time being precautionary. But I, can, I do know that DFO is taking this very seriously, and I'm expecting that you will probably hear in the new year um, new actions are going to